Thank you for inviting me back to Colorado. I said this last night to those of you who were there, but this is a place that to me feels like home. Um, I have really good memories of Colorado, and if I was not contractually obligated to say that I want to stay in Phoenix for the rest of my life, for at least two terms as mayor, if I had to choose somewhere else, it would be here. I definitely don't tell that to other states at their conventions, definitely don't go there to find out whether that's true. Um, so I want to start by talking to you about lobsters because there is a really cool video I watched online. I actually made Larry watch it, super nerd, by Rabbi uh, Abraham Tversky. And he talks about how he's in the dentist's office, he's reading about lobsters. He's waiting in the dentist's office, so why not read the article about the lobsters? Lobsters, when they grow, they're a soft, squishy fish that lives inside a hard shell. And lobsters, as they grow, they start to feel pain, they start to feel stressed, they start to feel constrained, and, and they hurt. When they feel this, they go under a rock where the other fish can't get them, and they take off that shell, they break out of that shell, and they grow a new shell. And the new shell is also hard and stiff, and as the lobster gets bigger, they go back under the rock, and they build a new shell. Now what's the point about this? Who cares about lobsters? The point is, if they didn't have that pain, that stress of growing, they would never get any bigger. They would never grow without the pain and the stress. Without that signal that there's something to overcome, there's something to break out of, they can never get any bigger. And he finishes up by saying, you know, if lobsters had doctors, they never grow. Because they go in, say it hurt, doctor would be like, here's a Valium, a couple Percocet, don't worry about it. And they're like, ah, oh, feel fine now. They say small. Y'all are lobsters. We are lobsters. We're just a happy crew of lobsters. What I mean by this, we were talking about this at the table. The Libertarian Party is uh, 43 years old? No, 49 years old. Something like that? Se 71, 49. The fact that a room full of libertarians can't agree on how old the party is just makes a point that I wasn't even trying to make. 47. 47, there we go. All right, he spoke with authority. I have to believe him. We got here by not quitting. We got here by never giving up, we got here by being such passionate, true believers in the Libertarian Party and the Libertarian principles that nothing could dissuade us from moving forward. And if you look around the room, there are a lot of new people here and there are a lot of old people here. The people who've been around for 20 or 30 or 40 years have seen things that you wouldn't believe. They've been through struggles that you wouldn't understand. They care very deeply about this party. They've built something special and we are all honored to be a part of it. That has sustained us and brought us to this moment that commitment, that sense of true believership, that almost religious fervor about what it means to be a libertarian. And that's not good enough anymore. And that is scary to people who got us to this point. There is a real fear that there are people who are gonna come into this party 
after the last presidential election or the one before it or the next one, or after they get tired of you know whoever the president is now and whatever crazy things their old party has done, they're going to come over and they'll tell you, they're like, we want them to come over, but they're not going to be like us. They're going to be different from us. And there's a fear that they're going to come in and they're going to change it. They're going to change this beautiful thing that we spent decades of our lives. We gave up hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars. We gave up time with our families. They're going to make it different. They're going to hurt the thing that I love. That's the pain. That's the pain. We tripled the vote totals in 2016, and there are still people in the party who are mad about that, about all of the people that came in in 2016 that are not real libertarians. They don't really believe. They're just washed up Republicans. They're never Trumpers. They're burnt out Bernie Kratz. They're whatever they are. What they are not is us. They are them. That's the growth. We're too big for the shell. It hurts. So we can do one of two things. We can decide that we don't want to grow beyond our comfort zone. We can take a Valium or a Percocet or a Ron Paul or a podcast or, you know, go back and reread Bastiat or do whatever we do to feel good, scream taxation is theft, have a slogan, whatever. We can do that. That is a path. And there are people who want to go down it. We can break our shell. We can realize that we are at an inflection point as a party. This is the point at which we stop being on the outside looking in to politics and we start driving the debate. We have an opportunity to drive the debate. It's an opportunity that is not entirely of our own making. It's always good to recognize luck. The biggest complaint I hear from major donors who have not traditionally supported the Libertarian Party, while they may have supported Libertarian institutions, is neither the Republicans nor the Democrats believe their own stuff anymore. They don't stand for what they say they stand for. They are, to be really blunt and short, lying. That bothers people. If you were in the talk earlier today, Dr. Philly has talked about Overton windows, about how there's an Overton window of trust that you have to be trusted in order to be voted for. The Republicans and Democrats are busy moving themselves out of the trust Overton window. They're moving themselves to a place where no one will vote for them anymore because they are liars. We can't control how long they do this, by the way. They'll do it for as long as they do it until they start feeling some pain and either grow or die. But we can take advantage of it, which means we need to, as a party, be welcoming to people whose agreement with the Libertarian Party is limited to, there's an issue that I feel strongly about, that neither the Republicans nor the Democrats are gonna do anything about. You guys have the right position on that issue, and you guys are trusted because while we're small, nobody thinks we're not serious. There's not a person in politics, Republican, Democrat, mainstream, fringe, whatever, that thinks we're not serious about libertarianism. They know we're dead serious. You don't go into political battle over and over and over and over again and not get the seat and come back and do it again and again and again and again and again until you win if you're not serious. They may think we're dumb. As Larry says, they might be right. But they know we're serious. So we have to take these people whose only point of agreement is on one issue that we're right on, the old parties are wrong on, and we have to welcome them into our family. We have to let them be part of our club. We cannot tell them, you can't come in unless you want to legalize drugs 
because everyone has a moral, natural right to put whatever they want into their own body. You have to want it for that reason. You have to want it for that reason. You cannot want it because it criminalizes an entire generation of African-American men. That's not acceptable. That's collectivism. That's not allowed. You can't want that racist war on drugs to end just because it's racist. You have to do it for natural rights reasons. You can't want it because it's ineffective, and even though you'd love to prohibit drugs, you recognize it's a waste of law enforcement resources. That's not okay. You have to want it for natural rights reasons. If we eliminate people because they don't agree on the why, but they agree on the how, then we have given up free work. And as a business owner and a candidate and a political party chair, I try to never give up free work. When people want to help you, be good to them. The kindest thing you can do to someone who wants to help you is let them help you. I didn't understand this for a very long time. I'm not used to being in charge of stuff. And I resisted for a very long time letting somebody give me a ride, letting somebody answer some phone calls for me, letting somebody write things for me, letting somebody do stuff. And I don't remember who I read it from, but if somebody offers to do you a favor, they offer to do you a kindness, they invite you to their home for dinner, they offer to host a fundraiser, if they offer to do something for you, they want to help you. People don't offer to do stuff for you if they don't want to help you. And if you deny them the opportunity to do somebody that they want to help a kindness, you're hurting them. You're denying them the good feelings you get when you help somebody else. And one of the things that you realize when you're on a mission, as we are all on a mission, when, as Larry says, we're on a passion project, when we are literally fighting for a better world for our children and our grandchildren, is this is an incredibly important thing that we do, and it is incredibly kind to other people to offer them the opportunity to help us do this. And whether that opportunity is with their time, whether it's them standing up to be candidates, as I'm sure pretty much everybody in this room is gonna do, otherwise Joe's gonna follow you home. Or if it's taking some of the resources that they've been blessed with and providing them to us to allow us to do the work, it is unkind to them not to ask. It's unkind. Because you're saying, how can I put this? By the way, I haven't looked at those notes in a long time. We're in a walk for a wild ride. <laughs> if your kid had some sort of terrible disease, and money was the object, and it was money, you couldn't afford the treatment, is there a single person in this room that you wouldn't ask to help save your child's life? A single one, where you wouldn't say, you know, my kid's gonna die if they don't get this treatment and I don't have that much money. Is there anyone you wouldn't ask in this room to help your child? Anyone? No, of course not. If you believe, as I believe, that the country is moving in a wrong direction, that it's moving away from the principles on which it was founded, it's moving in a direction towards more government control and less individual freedom for all of us to raise our families and find our happiness. That is a critical disease that this country has. And one of the treatments requires money. 
And I have no qualms about asking every one of you in the room to give and give quite a bit, to save it any more than I would if it was my own child. So give money. Next time I ask you, not tonight. Fine, give it tonight. If you must. I, I, can't, I can't be unkind to you and not let you if you want to. So welcome new people. We have to be welcoming. We have been not welcoming for too long. We have had a tendency to kind of corner new people and go down our laundry list and find the thing that they don't agree with us on and then beat them up for an hour about the thing they don't agree with us on, find out that they still don't agree with us because they weren't persuaded by being yelled at for some reason, yeah. Say, you know what, you sound like you're not really a libertarian, this is probably not the right place for you, you should leave. Believe it or not, most people, if you invite them to leave, they will go and they will be off the path. There's this whole concept of a path. Most of us were not fully sprung, formed from our mother's womb as 100, 100 Nolan Chart Libertarians. Most of us, some of us, I know, you're special. Um, we all came down a path. I was talking to Betty Rose. She had major differences with the Libertarian Party platform from 1979 to 1994. That's a lot of years to be wrong about something. And if people, if too many people, if people she cared about had confronted her in the years between 79 and 94 and said, if you don't agree with the party on borders, you're not a libertarian, you should go. At some point she would probably go. And then we wouldn't have Betty Rose and then all of you who were in Orlando in 2016 wouldn't have had that convention. That was the most successful convention in national party history. And it would not have happened without her. And she would have not have been there to do that if someone along the way had knocked her off the path. Every one of you is incredibly powerful in your ability to either grow new libertarians into new leaders and activists and candidates, and hopefully at some point, national party chairman, so that I can have a rest. Or, you have the power to knock them off the path and make them leave. Use that power wisely because there's a lot of work to be done and not enough hands to do it. There's a reason that I chose the goal of 2,000 candidates nationwide. One, I like round numbers. Two, it's well beyond what we've done historically. Well beyond. 2.7 times, call it three times just for the hell of it. What that means, get you into my crafty little devious strategy mind, it means that we cannot achieve the goal with the existing resources and activists that we have. It is not possible to grow from an average of 600, 650 candidates in midterm to 2,000 candidates with all the same people who are already involved in the party. It's fundamentally not possible. It's, 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 it's a logistical problem. It's math. Which means every one of you, everyone on our staff that is tasked with this project, every state chair and state political director has the job of going down registered voter lists and databases, getting on the phone and talking to people who have never been directly involved with the party beyond signing a form to say I'm a libertarian registered voter or beyond signing up for a national party newsletter or LP News. You have to reach out to them to get them to run for office, to get them to be campaign managers, to get them to be treasurers, to get them to help keep our candidates out of prison for campaign finance violations, to get them to knock on doors. You need them. You have to break the shell. You have to do it. I can't do it. Barely, barely handle my children. But I need help, is the point. Uh, my wife handles quite a bit, and if I didn't have her, I would probably be much crazier than I am. Um, I chose that goal for that reason, because it requires growth. So we might fail 
but we'll at least try hard. That requires welcoming people that we haven't traditionally been welcoming to. There are not a lot of people of color in the room. I know we've been doing panels on it, we've been getting better on it, but we're not as good as we could be. We can always try and do better. It's something we need to try and do better. And the way you do that is you go into communities, you go into neighborhoods, you run for office, you knock on doors, and you ask them, what is important to you? And you listen, and you listen, and you listen, and you listen. And you don't fight. And if there is a libertarian solution to the thing that's important to them, you talk about that. And you say, this is something that I want to do if I'm elected to work on that issue that's a big issue in this community. It's not my community. I'm not going to pretend it's my community. You can't pretend. You have to be you. But you can, by just the fact of going out and listening and caring about what they care about, is an incredibly powerful tool. If you listen to people, everyone's your friend. People think the best conversationalists are the people who actually say the least words. You let other people talk. Everyone loves to talk about themselves. How many people in this room came to the Libertarian Party because of guns? Show of hands. One, just one? Colorado, you're disappointing me. How many because of taxes? Oh, some people care about money. Um, how many people because of homeschooling or you know anti-schooling or getting your kids out of government schools or getting the government out of education? Good, good, quite a few, got it, okay. Um, here's what I'm gonna tell you. All of you came for the right reason and nobody cares what your reason is. I mean, I care, obviously, very empathetic person. The important thing is the person who's out in that hallway, who works for the hotel, who doesn't identify as libertarian today, who's overheard snippets of conversation during the convention, it's what thing did they hear that resonated with them? What thing mattered to them enough that they came up to one of you and said, you know, that's an interesting convention. What are you guys all about? That is the most important issue today, at that moment, in that conversation. So you need to learn this talent of forgetting about what's important to you when you're talking to new people and listening to what's important to them. Because then they'll come along and then some point in the future, at the next year's convention, when they're sitting at a table because they bought a ticket, because they're now engaged, involved, and interacting over a drink, you can talk to them about homeschooling, and they'll listen to you. Or you can talk to them about guns, and they'll listen to you. Or you can talk to them about taxes, and they'll listen to you. Because they care about you now. Because you listen to them. I want to talk about people in the Libertarian Party especially people that may make you upset or angry or you may think are counterproductive or wrong or maybe should shut their mouths, not be the face of things. Pick your thing. Does anyone ever watch cop shows? Okay, good, good. Everybody knows about good cop, bad cop, right? It's a standard plot trope. Good cop, bad cop, good cop, bad cop, good cop, bad cop. Do you know why they don't do cop shows with good cop, good cop? It's boring. You might not be able to find two good cops. That's, that's a dig. I didn't say that. I heard it. Womp, womp. Hey, Tony's right there. He, he must know somebody like him. Um, do you know why they don't do bad cop, bad cop? Not so much boring, very exciting, very short period of time, dead suspect, very quickly, very quickly. Bad cop, bad cop just goes into a backyard and guns somebody down holding the cell phone. But they don't put it on TV, because it's not entertaining. So see, I'm still right. 
You do good cop, bad cop because of the contrast. The contrast is what gets suspects to talk in the police procedural, right? Bad cop comes in, starts throwing around rubber hoses, starts beating phone books, starts slamming doors, talks about how this guy's going up river and he's never getting out and blah, 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 blah. blah, 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 blah. The good cop comes in with a cup of coffee. It's like, hey, you look like you could use a cup of coffee. Do you smoke? We can go outside. You can smoke a cigarette. Between the two of them, in at least the police interrogations I've watched in defending people accused of crimes, they often extract confessions out of people who didn't want to confess because of the contrast. We also have good cops and bad cops. We have people that go out and protest in the streets about gun rights, about homeschooling, about whatever. They go out and they take very bold positions that get in people's faces and they talk about no compromise and macho flash and all of the stuff that makes people mad and makes them angry and makes them get on Facebook and makes them go write to people and say angry letters and all this stuff and it really turns people off and they're like, oh, I can't believe he said that thing. That's terrible. That's what opens people up to good cops who come in and say, you know, I'm a former governor of a, a Western state and I worked with parties, you know, I worked with people on all parts of the political spectrum. We were able to make a lot more freedom without doing anything nuts or not doing anything crazy. And we can address some of the issues that you have in a way that's not like that crazy guy. I'm not, I'm not that guy. That guy, obviously, he's... But, you know, I really care about my community and my kids, and, and I'm a small business owner, and I, I want to try and do what I can to move us into a direction that gives you more power over your own life. How about you sign my petition? How about you vote for me? How about you give me some money? You can't have the good cops without the bad cops, and you can't have the bad cops without the good cops. And we would do ourselves a lot of favors if we would spend less time trying to figure out which one of them we're going to kick out of the party and not talk about the stuff that isn't our sort of lane and go say, you know, I didn't say that. This is what I think about that issue. I'm so glad that because you're so mad about this other thing that you started a conversation with me because I have a different perspective on it. Let's talk about that. Or the people who look at somebody like Senator Epke, because she's here, and say, you know, that's not even libertarian. That's like barely tinkering around the edges. I'm like, well, you know, there is a radical caucus. They have a lot of candidates who want to just burn the thing down. And you're welcome in this party too. Maybe she's not the one you want to support. Maybe you don't canvas for her. That's fine. But it's, it's that ability to not have to have an opinion on everything. To be able to say, you know, that's not the... Great phrase somebody once taught me. That's the kind of thing you like if you like that kind of thing. That's how I feel about certain kinds of music, certain kinds of movies, certain books. It works for other people. Not me so much, but you know, if you're happy, I'm happy. We're all happy. Everybody's valuable in this party. And those complementary strategies, you don't have the success of Martin Luther King without the implied, implicit, and sometimes actual violence of Malcolm X. They don't work without each other. You don't have Gandhi without the real riots and sometimes terrorism in the struggle for Indian independence. You have to have both. You have to have moral authority, and you have to have the threat of some crazy stuff going down too. Those are the two pieces of the puzzle. One of the things about libertarian politics that so, makes it so easy to fight against the two old parties is as a fundamental idea of political economy, politics is about having the power to control other people's lives. That is politics. Politics is about who's in charge over everybody else. And that's why it gets so dirty and nasty is that Republicans want to be in charge so that they can say, you can do this and this and this, but you can't do this other thing. Democrats want to be in charge so they can say, no, you can do this, this, and this. You can't do those things. All of them want to be in charge to be like, give me your money. I know how to spend it better than you ever will. 
Libertarian politics is, is anti-politics. It's fundamentally different because on the spectrum from individual freedom, you get to run your own life, to government control, somebody else gets to run your life, we want to move towards individual freedom on every issue all the time. No exceptions, no, no backing off, no special favors, no special pleading. We always want more individual freedom. That is our priority. That is fundamentally not what the rest of politics is about. That's all about increasing government control. Even if you have to give somebody a little individual freedom as a trade-off, you still want more control. We want less. Once people get that, that resonates with them. When you put it into terms about their own life, that we are fundamentally different, and then you get away from this stupid left-right paradigm of is it, is it conservative or is it progressive? It doesn't matter. It's freedom versus government. It's you run your life versus someone else runs your life. That's the only spectrum we care about. And on some issues, we're with the left on that. And on some issues, we're at the right. And on some issues, like cannabis legalization or, you know, at this point, open immigration, we're not with either of them because they're both wrong. We need to take advantage of those things and really hit on those issues where we resonate with the communities that we live in. There is within the party these other political spectra between radical and pragmatist, right? Are you over on the radical side or the pragmatic side? There's a political spectrum within the party. Are you an anarchist that wants no government? Or are you a minarchist that wants a lot less government? Where do you fall on that spectrum? There are people in the party that spend an inordinate and I think unproductive amount of time figuring out where we're at on these two spectra. They fight over it. There is a third spectrum that I think might be slightly more important. And that is the spectrum between are you a nice person or are you a jerk? Or insert your favorite synonym for jerk. I don't care. If you want more freedom on any issue and you're willing to identify as libertarian, I don't care where you are on any of these spectra, radical, pragmatist, anarchist, minarchist, left, right, do not care, could not care less. I want you up here at nice, and I don't want you down here at jerk, because I can teach a nice person how to be more libertarian. I can take a nice minarchist and turn him into an anarchist. They're still nice. I can teach a jerk to be libertarian all day, but all he does is go and yell at other libertarians and drive them out of the party. It's a lot harder to change that. You get what you tolerate, you get what you recruit for. So recruit for kindness first. We'll teach him about issues later. There are orphan issues right now. Um, the big one right now is spending cuts. There is no political party in this country other than ours that wants to reduce the amount of money that is taken from you that is spent by the government. Not one. There is not one. There are maybe a handful of congressmen and senators who sometimes kind of almost stand up for that and they are viciously beaten by their own party and they are in a dead end and they should leave. But, you know, I don't run their lives and they're allowed to keep beating their head against a brick wall as long as they want. Just don't get in my way. We can, we can run on that because there is a pension crisis, because government is running out of money, because politicians whose solution is only give me more money because I need more money because I spent all the money that you gave me, are not and have not ever really been popular with people. There is nobody standing up for the right of free migration in this country. The Democrats, I mean, people say that we're not serious politicians. The level of political incompetence of Chuck Schumer in giving up DACA that had something like 86% national polling, so 
86% national polling support for not deporting kids who were brought here by their parents. 86% and controlled the keys to the government shutting down. You cannot be dealt better cards in politics than having an 86% issue and the ability to turn off the money. It, it can't happen. And what did he do? He negotiated away a three-week extension for the willingness to talk about it. Yes. And they talked about it. And did it make it into the $1.3 trillion omnibus? It did not. It did not. They're not serious political strategists. They're serious about retaining power. But we can be more effective political strategists because we can go to those issues where there is that support and stand up and speak truth and get people on our sides. Canvas legalization is still there. Um, and free trade. There is no free trade party anymore. It's just an argument over which businesses you're going you're gonna to pick. We can talk about those issues, but in all of these issues, you have to talk about them in ways that resonate with the community that you're running in, whether it's the country, the state, the district, the county, the city, whatever. You have to talk about them in ways that it makes lives better for people in your community. And if you can't figure that out, ask somebody. We have people on staff who will help you if you're a candidate. We will help. There are ways to talk about everything that resonates. There's ways, excuse me, to talk about everything that will turn off even a person who agrees with you. Don't do the latter. When you go out, I want you to fight hard, but I want you to be kind. And that goes double for your opponents. Debates, as Larry pointed out, are not about the people on the stage. They are about the people who are listening. You cannot lose the moral high ground, and the first way to lose the moral high ground is to attack other people. You have to be nice to your opponents. You have to be the nicest one in the room. You attack positions, you don't attack people. You don't say, you know, this sitting congressman is a terrible human being because he wants to, you know, lock up black people and I think he's terrible. You say, you know, I don't think that the 40, 50, 60 years, however long we are in it now, of the racist war on drugs has been effective, but this congressman thinks that it would be a good idea to incarcerate another generation of African-American men, taking them out of their communities, making it so they can't parent, making it so they can't get housing and they can't get good jobs in order to pursue a failed strategy with your money. So I'll let him explain why he thinks that's a good idea. I didn't say anything mean about him. He's a wonderful human being, I'm sure. He might be wrong about this particular issue, but let's give him an opportunity. Let's let him talk. We need to fight that frame that we're the weird ones. We're the only sensible ones. And when you, when you speak truth, Maj Ture, who runs uh, Black Guns Matter, which is a really cool group, go and speak your truth and expose the contradictions in the other side. Not with any, any animosity. You just show where the holes are, where it breaks down and doesn't get them to the goals that they're trying to get to. And then you say, you know, if we can agree that that's not working, could we agree that it might be a good idea to try something new? Could we? It's audience participation, come on. I've been working my book. We haven't been elected to this office before, so wouldn't it be trying something new to vote for a libertarian? Let's try something new this time. If it doesn't work, hey, I'll quit. You have to be happy, warriors. Um, I used to have a different speech where I talked about this. You have to pick things up by the right handle. You can't pick up the cup of going out and running as a libertarian candidate with not high odds of success with the handle of you're a losing loser who loses and you're going to lose. And so why are you even bothering? Because you're going to lose. And why would I even vote for you? Because you're going to lose. Why are you losing? You're losing loser. That is the handle that our opponents would like us to pick up the cup by. Because it hurts. And when it hurts enough, eventually you get discouraged. 
But if you pick up the handle that there are people in my community, in my town, in my city, that want something better for their kids and their grandkids, who are fed up with the way things have been run, who need a voice for them and for their ideas, and when I go out and I put on that jersey that says libertarian, just like when somebody puts on a football jersey, you carry the hopes and dreams for that election of every person that thinks like us. You give them hope that they're not alone. You touch their lives in ways that you can't even, even understand. And when you pick it up by that handle, you can run over and over and over again. And I will tell you, I call the old parties old parties, not only because it's a subtle dig, because it is, because it's true. They're old. Not only have they been around longer, but you should go to some of their meetings. They'll die before we quit. I want to give you some sense of optimism. Everything in politics is absolutely true, 100% ground truth. Everyone tells you it's absolutely the way it is until it's not. Everyone said the right way to win a campaign was with direct mail and lots of money and big dollar fundraisers and mass media airdrops until the Obama campaign came in and Isenberg and the data guys went and said, turns out that's not true anymore. Now you win this way. Then they thought, well, we're going to win exactly that way. How he won. So Clinton got all of his people to run the same campaign that he ran in 08 and 12. It turned out that was no longer the right way to win. It was this other way, with or without some help from somebody else. Who knows? I'm just asking questions. The Berlin Wall was an ironclad, solid wall between East and West Germany. And if you tried to cross it, you would be killed. And it was never coming down. And it, it was just a truth. This side of the country and that side of the country are never coming together. It's broken. You can't get through it. It is a wall. It is a wall with snipers on it. And then one day in 1989, it was 89, right? One day in 1989, a bunch of people just started pulling it down. I mean, it was easy. It was Soviet construction, so it wasn't that good. <laughs> kind of crumbly. Not enough rebar. But they just pulled it down. And when enough people pull it down, the guys on the towers with the sniper rifles are like, I don't have only but so many bullets. And then they give up too. Because, you know, tank man in Tiananmen, that's a dude standing in front of a tank. It's a dude standing in front of a tank. And it's in China. And so the ironclad political truth would be, they're going to run that dude down, because why not? They got a tank, he's got shopping bags. Shopping bags don't be tanks, I think. But they didn't. He didn't know how powerful he was until he stood up. Who is the most important libertarian? You are. It's not me, it's not Larry, it's not Laura. It, well, it is for Laura. She is. But it is for John, too. He is. You are the most important libertarian. You will be the most important libertarian in most of the people in your life. Most of your neighbors, most of your friends, most of your coworkers, you are the most important libertarian they will ever meet. And if you are good to them and kind to them and you live your witness and you don't yell at them and you don't argue with them, they will become libertarians and then they will become the most important libertarian. And that's how we grow. I was reading some Guy Kawasaki. Do you know who Guy Kawasaki was? I mean, Larry, Larry's read pretty much every leadership and inspirational book known to man. Guy Kawasaki was the chief evangelist for Apple Computer, for the Macintosh project, back during the real heyday of Steve Jobs. And he developed this idea of evangelism versus marketing. The idea that the way you sell IBM or the way you sell Windows is you just saturate people with ads and say, you know, buy this because everyone else is buying it. And if you don't buy it, you're stupid or, you know, it'll make you sexy or whatever. Standard advertising. And he realized that this was a guerrilla product. This was an outsider product. This was the sort of thing that no IT manager was ever going to buy for their employees. 
He needed a different way. And he would go to companies and he would find people at the lower echelons. And he would get them on fire for the product. He would find the people who would be true believers. He would get them on fire and they would go and they would change the world. They would live and die for the Macintosh. They would have brand loyalty where they would get Apple tattoos on their arms. And they would tell everybody they knew how awesome this computer was, how this would change your life. And that's how they were successful. One of his ideas for evangelism, you're going to meet people who are atheists. And you're going to meet people who are agnostics. Atheist is the person who is a hardcore Windows person. They're never going to buy a Macintosh. They don't care. They're going to fight you about it. And they're going to talk about how it's too expensive and it's ugly and blah, 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 blah. The agnostics are going to say, gosh, you know, I don't really know much about a Macintosh. I use an IBM at work, but, you know, what's, what makes it different? Ignore the atheists. Seek the agnostics. Because agnostics can be converted. Atheists sometimes can. I was actually challenged on this the last time I gave this speech. I said, well, I was convinced that libertarianism was terrible, and I got beaten into it. I said, well, I'm very glad that you're here. But as a matter of sales and numbers and how many people we all get to talk to in our day, in our life, you would be a lot better off talking to people who are open to our ideas but skeptical as opposed to people who already convince themselves they don't want to be us. This is true in petitioning. This is true in getting votes. One of the best things about voter ID, I don't know if Larry talked about it during ground game, voter ID is identifying voters. Now, you identify the voters who are going to support you because you get them to be volunteers. You're going to put up a sign. You get them to give you money. You identify soft supporters because you go back and ask again because people get worn down by multiple asks. But one of the most important things to identify in doing voter ID is hardcore supporters of your opponent. Do you know what you do in a well-run campaign with a hardcore supporter of your opponent after you've knocked on the door and identified them as that? You never send them a lit piece. You never have another volunteer knock on their door. You never call them. You never put up, you never try and get them to put up a sign. You become invisible to them. Because it's both about galvanizing the people who support you and building a false sense of complacency in the people who oppose you. This goes double for libertarians. You don't want to be visible to the people who don't like you. You want them to think, FQ, is she even still running? I have no idea. I haven't heard anything about it. I'm, no postcards, nothing. Don't get into fights with people that already are diametrically opposed to us. Bring the people in who are with us on something and help them grow. Help them grow into the new leaders. Good leaders get followers. Great leaders create new leaders. We can build our people up into being that next generation of activists. The last thing I want to leave you with is something that I think is very important. I talked about how we're not we're not politics in the traditional sense. We're, we're anti-politics. I want to tell you a secret. I don't like everyone in my family. There are people in my family that I don't really want to babysit my kids. There are people in my family that have unfriended me on Facebook and I don't like to talk to. There are people in my family that just kind of rub me the wrong way. Well, you know a second secret? I don't like everyone in the Libertarian Party. It's true. Joe knows. It's only Joe, though. Just kidding. Um, but if a member of my family comes over for Thanksgiving dinner, I'm nice to them. I'm kind to them, I pass the potatoes, I avoid the subjects that we don't agree on. If a member of my family is locked in jail, I will post bail for them. 
If they need me, I will help them. Because while I don't like everyone in my family, I love everyone in my family. We are, as a party, focused on individuals, focused on people. We're a fundamentally human party. We're pro-people. We're anti-politics. And in that way, we are a lot more like a family than a party. We're a small family still. We're getting bigger, but not fast enough. And I don't need every one of you in this room to like everyone else in this room. I don't. It'd be better at functions like this if maybe you don't fight and you do actually pass the potatoes. But I don't need you to like each other. But the one thing I'll ask you for before I leave the stage, I need you all to love each other. I need you to go out there and be there for each other. I need you to understand that we are all in this together, that we are too small to excommunicate people from the family, that everyone has value, that all of us have a place, and that these are the people who will be there for you if you will be there for them. So with that, love each other, be well, and thank you so much for listening.